Hi guys, it's Kirsty here, ready to go live with the Truth Teller series and my guest tonight, Kevin Hines. Hey Kevin. Hey, how are you? Good, I'm so excited to have you here with us. So we're going to be talking about mental health and suicide. Now back in 2000, September 2000, um, was when you attempted to commit suicide um, and had it gone to plan, you wouldn't be here with us, um, but thank God that you made it. Um, and one of the rare people to make it to survive, right, off that San Francisco bridge. Yeah, one of uh, 36 people in an 80-year span to survive a, a fall off the Golden Gate Bridge, a jump, yeah. How painful was it? It was the most painful experience I've had physically in my entire life. Uh, and, and I've been in some extreme pain in my life. This was absolutely the worst. Now, um, we're going to jump back and forward in terms of the timeline, but I think that, you know, we were just chatting before we started filming, and I think that it's important for people to know that you still have these thoughts. So it's not as though 16, 17 years have passed and all of a sudden you're healed and you're completely fine. You've just learned to manage it. So I asked you the question, um, when was the last time you contemplated suicide? Last time I thought about it was about four months ago. And... The, the good news is I learned over all this time fighting my disease, bipolar disorder, that, that my thoughts don't have to become my actions. Mm -hmm. I, I often liken it to, in, in, a, in, a, in a setting of, of, of a speech that I do, if I say, uh, how, how many of you out there listening right now, uh, if your thoughts became your actions, would be in jail for road rage? And a bunch of people raised their hands. And I said, how many people would be in a bunch of trouble for other reasons if their thoughts always became their actions and everybody raises their hand? If we recognize that our thoughts don't have to always become our actions, thus the same goes for suicidal thoughts and ideals and inclinations, that just because you think it or because your brain tells you it's, it has to happen, it doesn't make it so. It doesn't make these thoughts have to own, rule the day, or, uh, or define you. And so I recognize today, while living with all the symptoms I've ever had of bipolar disorder type 1 with psychotic features, which is a lot of symptoms, that I still have them and it's okay. I'm going to fight to be well every day I can. I love that. Thank you for sharing that and being so vulnerable and upfront. I think that it's important for people to see the truth of, of what it is to live with mental health. And even when you become an advocate and you're out there and, they, as I said, they can put you on a pedestal and think, he's got it all sorted. Um, so for anyone who's just tuning in, um, we can see comments and I can um, put the comments up. Hey, Maricel's saying she's present. She's got a hand up um, with her little emoji. So please um, comment and engage and I'll come back to questions because it's hard to be doing both while I'm talking to Kevin. Um, for those just choosing in, uh, tuning in, Kevin um, had attempted suicide back in 2000 and is now a mental health advocate speaker, has just come out with a documentary called The Ripple Effect and we're going to be talking about all of that tonight. So, Kevin, you were just sharing that the last time that you'd felt suicidal was four months ago and that you still live with all of these um, bipolar uh, disorder. Now, I'm going to get some of the, like, I want to put out, out a, a caveat here. Sometimes I say things in the wrong way and I don't know all the lingo and I'm not always politically correct, but I have a great heart. So um, if I get things wrong, this is a safe place for us all to share and all to learn. Um, now, so can you list some of those things so people can have an idea of what you're dealing with? What does your brain um, feel like for you? Absolutely. Uh, so when, when I get like when I get in a bad place mentally, uh, often what happens is things like extreme paranoia occurs. And that means that I think often, often enough that people are out to get me trying to hurt me or trying to kill me. Even um, I'll be at a I'll be at, I'll be at the airport which I see on a regular basis because I travel the world telling my story uh, 300 days out of the year. And if I'm uh, having a bad mental health day and if I'm paranoid, I absolutely begin to believe that all the people in the, in the airport, men, women, children, uh, others are, are there to kill me. Uh, and I, and, and it's hard to shake. It's hard to break free from, but here are the steps I take. I have about seven or eight people on my call list that when, it, when this happens, the first thing I do is tell somebody who loves me. I call them and I say, this is happening and I feel like these people are here to hurt me. And they say, Kevin, let's use the logic to combat that. Have the people who you think are going to kill you ever killed you? No. 
Okay. How often has this happened? You thinking other people are going to hurt you or harm you or kill you all the time. When was the last time it actually occurred? Never. Logic states, I'm not going to die and no one at the airport is going to take my life. So have you coached them on those specific questions? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so there's a select group of people in my life that are my, I call them my personal protectors. And oh, when I am, yeah, and they're, they're, they're absolutely a part of my mental health emergency plan. And my plan includes uh, everybody in this plan having the information to arm themselves to, to battle my mental fight so that I'm not doing it alone. And that's the thing that, that really is the difference for me is finding the people uh, supportive enough to be there in that kind of situation, which is hard for your loved ones or family members or friends to be there for. And then you talk about all the people that don't have that kind of relationship with their family and friends. So it's even harder for them. So it's not, it's not, it's more easily said than done, but I believe it is possible to find people who love and care for you in this world who will be those personal protectors uh, who understand your mental struggles and will get your back in those times of, uh, of great need. Yeah, I think that it's, it's twofold. I think, yes, I agree. It can be hard. And being as a single woman, I think about this a lot. Like I'm, I am incredibly self-aware. I've done a lot of the inner work. Um, I have a lot of tools. And even for me, sometimes it's like, it's hard to ask someone, like, especially when you're sad, like when you're feeling rejected or alone or just tired of being single or whatever it is in your life for different people. But in that moment is when we least want to reach out and ask somebody and we don't always want to have to pick up the phone and go through the whole thing. We just want someone to know. And yeah. for single people, I think that's even harder because there's not someone in the house that just picks up on your vibe like a partner would. Um, yeah. So what do you say to people in that situation? Like is it about just going making a conscious choice and reteaching yourself that you have to reach out and you have to ask more? In my opinion, it's it's making an effort to build a plan in place so that when you are unstable and you are for those for those small amounts of times that you are not self aware with your mental struggle, um, making sure that there are people in place who uh, who can try to get your back when you're struggling and who understand the severity of what you're going through and who empathize and comprehend and Maybe they don't understand because they don't live your life, but they certainly uh, can put your se their selves in, in your shoes or at least try to for the time being and say, okay, these are the times when my, my friend, my loved one, my coach, my family, my someone uh, has my back in these times when I'm really hurting because I can't do this alone. Yeah. And that's, that's the difference in, in, in my life is uh, this ability to recognize that none of this can be fought alone, yes. uh, solely by yourself. It's too much to bear. But if you have people who can comprehend your pain and empathize, you have people that you can opt into your plan to be there uh, when you're struggling so that uh, you, have, you have built your own support system. And maybe that's not the family you were born to. Maybe that's the family you make someday. Maybe those are the people that you opt into your circle so that you can be safe because suicide is not the answer. It never was. It never, it never has been. It never will be. Um, and when I have my suicidal thoughts, the first thing I do is call someone in that circle and say, I need help and I need it now. I love this. I love these personal protectors. I'm going to get some. And yeah. I mean, I have myself have not been suicidal, but I think as you know, I said, it can be just from loneliness, depression. Everyone's at different spectrums when they need that. I remember a friend sending me a text that literally just said 911. And that was his way of saying like, I'm in a really bad place. It was during a breakup. It was his first really brutal breakup. And I thought, how powerful is that? I should, you know, I think that that you can have a code with your personal yeah. protectors and your friends. It's like, this is when I say this word, I am yeah. not in a good place and I need yeah. you to pick up the phone and to come find me. Um, and Marisol mentioned, you know, that she's been struggling with depression and uh, she doesn't have close family. So how does she create that network? And I think that, you know, when I was listening to you, I was kind of hearing a lot of what I hear from some of my friends with AA, that they have their um, support buddy. 
And so, you know, whether it's going to a depression support group or somewhere else to find those people, like you said, that understand mental health and they know how severe yeah. this can be um, when you call. Yeah, I think I think being uh, open to creating that network of people in 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 your in your world, you know, going out and becoming a member of the local NAMI chapter, National Alliance on Mental Illness, uh, so you can make those friends. Going out and becoming involved in some some mental health group of some kind, there are plenty all over this country who are um, make themselves available to people in their time of need, and you can build those friendships or kinships over time so that you, you don't feel so alone and so you find people uh, that are like-minded who can who can be a support of some kind in that desperate pain. Also, you know, looking out at the social connectedness we have in this in this world today, and 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 creating uh, those kind of relationships uh, just for this purpose alone. I mean, that's also important, especially if you do live alone, if you are single, if you don't have a lot of a large friend group, if you don't have a uh, that familial connection uh there are places you can go to to create them uh and it might take some time so you might have to find the time when you're doing relatively well to explain yourself to someone uh so that you don't feel so alone in this world because no one should should go at this kind of battle all by themselves you know it's, and i it's, think that yeah. you know regardless of whether you have a mental health illness or not i think we are in a time when we're isolating more. We're not having family units with mum, dad, generations in one home. A lot of the times it's we're very nuclear, less than two or three people in a home. And there is so much more social media. So people are thinking that they're connected, but they're craving this real connection. Yeah. And so I think, like you said, it takes work. Like I moved to America from Australia and I've moved cities, gosh, probably nearly 10 times. And it takes a good two, three years for me to build friendships. And then even then, sometimes like I was just thinking it's been nearly six years and I was thinking recently like I need some really close, close friends who are closer to me in distance because in LA you might be two hours from someone in traffic so you don't get to see them. So, But it's work. I have to put that intention in. I have to be clear. I have to find who those people are, nurture those relationships so that when we have these hard times, they are there for you, but also just to have fun with and, and lift you up. Yeah, it's very important. And, and I think when I think you'll find that when you put the work in to build those connections, um, that it'll be easier to talk to someone, uh, you know, when you're in that kind of pain and and say, you know, I'm, I'm going through it. And that's OK, yeah. because everybody, no matter who they are in the whole world, has got issues. Yes. And if I can be honest about my own to at least some people, um, then I can have them be those kind of personal protector types that have got my back and 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 I don't have to uh, live so isolated and, and, and in so much pain siloed. And I think once we do that, once we build those networks over time and recognize that we have the power, we those struggling mentally or those who are not have the power to create those friendships and those those relationships so that we can get through every day one day at a time and they're all baby steps you know it's just a it's just a matter how you look at it what are the so now obviously you're at one end of the spectrum when it comes to mental health especially with the hallucinations and the um feeling compelled the mania compelled to commit suicide and hearing these voices in when you're in schools and you're advocating, I mean, you're obviously meeting thousands and thousands of people who are coming up to you who have had all sorts of challenges. What are you seeing as universal kind of issues in terms of mental health and anxiety and the dysfunctional thinking that people are having that seems to be widespread? The universal, uh, the, the, the thing that I travel around the world and see the most, uh, which makes me so sad, and, and, and please listen up to this, it is an individual, usually young, will come up and say, I have been diagnosed with such and such, but my parents don't believe it's real. Kirsty, I see that everywhere I go. 
every high school I go to, doesn't matter what continent they're on. That's what someone says. I have this disease, but my parents or my family doesn't believe it's real. So they go to school and they're validated in their pain and they come home and they're told it's not real and that it doesn't really exist and that it's all in their heads. It breaks my heart every single time. If you are out there and you are watching today and you have a loved one crying out for mental health help and care and you think it's all in their heads, take a step back, please. And realize that the brain is an organ just like any other organ. As a matter of fact, any other organ in the body, it's the most powerful one. It controls every action and inaction we take, every decision and indecision. It controls, in essence, a great many of pieces of the rest of our organs. And if the brain is malfunctioning, for lack of a better term, there goes the rest of you. And if your brain is in pain, there goes the rest of you. And I think the people who don't comprehend that, need to take a minute to just realize that the brain can get sick just like any other organ diseased. And we forget that often. We forget that with our own family members that it is an organ. It is the largest one second only to the skin compared to other organs. It is crucial that it is well and brain healthy. And what bothers me about this is that we as a culture, Australia, America, England, doesn't matter, Japan, we as a culture have learned how to ignore the brain's cries for help. We as a culture have forgotten that when you're unwell mentally, it can be derived from the brain. So that saying it's all in your head, it comes from somewhere. It comes from a legitimate place. Mm. Um, and, and when you recognize that you can have a problem upstairs and it can be far worse than any physical pain you have ever experienced, and trust me, I know, I've experienced tremendous physical pain in my life, but it never, ever came close to, as my Australian friend Joe Williams always says, battling the enemy within, which is my head. Um, and so I do think you if, think yeah. when, I mean, we, we have a culture here where we do overprescribe and we do overdiagnose. So I think it's, it, I can see both sides that it's hard that when people are perhaps given that as a first thing, hmm. when they haven't looked at, exercise, which we know out of all of the things, I think there was a list of 100 things for depression, um, even down to electroshock. And the number one was 10 minutes of exercise to elevate their mood or meditation is like the ultimate pill. If we could give it to everyone, it could, you know, and so I also see the other side where people get frustrated that people haven't done anything to put any tools in their kit and they're going straight to a doctor and Xanaxing themselves out, which I also think, I think that there are situations where medications can clearly help with chemical imbalances but I think we also have situations where we're numbing people so they can't even feel what mm. they're feeling to do their healing mm. and there's that balance of how do we catch them early enough when you know they haven't gone down that downward spiral so that they can st you know so how do you sit with all of that well, you know, that, that's one thing people ask me all the time is, what medication are you on? Like, that's going to be some magical answer to everyone's problems. No, no, I, I do take medication, and it helps me. But ladies and gentlemen, it took me eight years to find the right medication for me. Eight years of struggling to find medication that worked properly every day for my better brain health. Eight years is a long time to wait. Right. To find and, and even then, you still no. had suicidal thoughts four months ago. Yeah, yeah, well, of course. And so there is no cure for mental illness. We know that. And for the people who say, you know, just go straight to medication. No, no, no. I work in a plan. Uh, my mental health plan is all-encompassing. Education as to this disease and how to fight it tooth and nail in every way that's reputable and proven. Exercise every single day. Uh, without fail, at least 23 minutes a day because it leads to 12 hours of better mood. Who doesn't want that? 12, <laughs> you know, t you exercise for 23 minutes, you feel better for 12 hours. What happens if you do that twice a day? 24 hours of better mood. Education, exercise, eating healthily most days. Uh, I got home from my long trip uh, this week and my wife had waiting for me Brussels sprouts uh, and, 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 um, and sweet potatoes uh, in, in a balsamic reduction, which is extremely healthy for your brain. Um, so I do all of these things. I find coping strategies uh, like uh, like reading and writing and drawing and painting 
to help myself stabilize. I do everything I can to better my own brain health. And if you want to learn my tools, it's very simple. Go to kevinhindstory.com, go to the multimedia section, and you will find my 10 steps to what I call the art of wellness. And it's free and it's for everybody because it's common sense tools that better brain health for anyone. So start there. Start with those common sense tools. On my plan is also medication, but it took me a long time to get used to that and to understand the, the intensity of it and the importance of it. For me, it doesn't work for everyone. Uh, and I do have a problem with doctors, primary care physicians, which I love. I have a good one today, a really good one, uh, but I didn't always. And these are folks that sometimes look at you for 15 minutes and say, here, take this. I'm sorry. Yeah. Would you tell that to a person with severe diabetes? Would you just be like, here, do this, take this? No. You first, you first say to the person, are you eating well? The person says, no, I'm not. I'm eating really crappy foods that are not healthy. Well, we need to change that. Are you exercising? No, I, that's why I weigh this much. Well, that, that, there's, the, there's the situation right there. Uh, here are your numbers. Let's talk about all of the things you can do to get your body into a stable position to fight this. Your, your diabetes, if that's the case. Um, and then, and then they say, if necessary, yeah. and here's some medication that might help. And this, um, for me, yeah. though, is where I feel very passionate in educating and informing the public that you need to do that for yourself. It would be wonderful if doctors thought like that, but sadly, a huge amount of them don't. So you cannot, the amount of people who go to them and they're just straight out with a script. So I feel like that's part of our job is to educate people, go and get that list of 10 things. And when you've tried all of them, if your mood has not shifted in the next yeah. 90 days and you haven't noticed a massive difference, then go and see the doctor and talk about other solutions. But I feel like try those things first. If you're not medicate, med meditating, if you're not exercising, if you're not um, getting your personal protectors together, if you're yeah. not talking with learning how to be vulnerable and learning and Olivia shared here that, you know, she's struggled her whole life um, with this and um, that it's my emotions can be very unstable and sharing this is extremely scary and humiliating. And that's the thing, you know, it is, it is scary and humiliating and hard when, when we can feel like that about ourselves. but is it better that or to be dead? Right. Is it better to, you know, have the courage right. to maybe try and reach out and tell people. And, and I know that Olivia has also gone through similarly to what you were talking about, that some of the family members can obviously feel like it's all in your head. And I know that she has, has had some of that coming in for her. So it's been tough. Yeah. And it, it is tough to, to get through to family that don't understand or, or won't empathize. And that, that, that does happen. You know, I, I had, I, I certainly had uh, friends before I attempted off the Golden Gate Bridge who didn't really, recognize the severity of my struggles because I kept it hidden from everybody for wow. so long. Uh, and when they learned of the severity of my struggles, uh, they disappeared. Uh, but my true friends shined through and I was able to pinpoint who uh, was there for me. Uh, and, 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 I, and I did, you know, it was a long journey going from struggling mentally every day to managing the disease and being able to recognize and be self-aware with the same disease that was driving me to destruction prior to, mm -hmm. um, and in, 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 in recognizing the symptoms, I was able to recognize the way to help them and get them to be more balanced. Uh, now, like I said, Kirsten, you know, I, I, I have all the symptoms I've ever had, mania, hallucinations, depression, paranoia, all of these things, but they are not at the level they once were. And when these symptoms occur, like I said, and I always will say, the first thing I do is turn to the people who love me the most and say, I need this help and I need it now. Yeah. And it doesn't mean I always go to a psych ward uh, for treatment. Sometimes I just need to, to, to be held Rational by my wife. Life. I mean, you know, yeah, sometimes totally. I just need that interpersonal connection where mm -hmm. someone has got my back. And if you feel you have no one, if you feel you have no one like that in your life, first of all, I'm so sorry. That's awful. But it's time to build those relationships from the ground up yeah. so that you're, you're not alone. And, and, and you might have to create that change. You might have to be the one that steps out of your comfort zone and reaches out to someone who, who may care and say, hey, you know, I'd really appreciate it if I could count on you when I'm struggling with this, that, A, B, or C. 
Well, and I think that we can all be that advocate. Like today, I was just telling you, I got stood up on a date last night. Well, I, put, I, you know, I was, I don't know what it was, but I felt so embarrassed. My neighbor happened to be at the same place and he said, let's have a drink before he gets here. And then he didn't show up. And obviously they knew. And I, I was like, why am I feeling shame? And I didn't do anything wrong. He's the one who was rude and disrespectful, but I didn't want to post about it today. And I normally share everything. And so I made the conscious choice that I'm going to post about this and talk about it because I know I have a lot of people who are on my wall who are single. But I think that those are the, you know, the daily ways that we shut down and we allow shame to take hold instead of being vulnerable. And I know that when I speak it, shame can't can't live in that space when I can speak it out loud. And so I chose to do that and I felt a hundred times better and I got to have some great conversations and to help some other people along the way. But to your point of, you know, when you um, found out that a lot of people kind of disappeared from your life, you know, I hear this a lot with different interviews I do, whether it's mental health or whether it's cancer, that a lot of times people, it's not about us, they just don't know how to deal with it. They don't have the tools to be vulnerable it's triggering all their stuff. And so I feel like this is all just like a big science experiment of life that we get to really learn about ourselves and about other people and and not to make meaning where there is no meaning and which can make us feel a little bit crazy and bring on that anxiety um, rather than going, you know, maybe this doesn't have anything to do with me. It's about them and they, they're, they're just not for me in my life right now. And I need, and the same with family and friends. It's like I've had to choose at different times. Um, you know, when I talk to them about all the work I do, they have very different beliefs around, um, addiction and different things. And so yeah. I feel like sometimes you have to choose that. Uh, I love them and I can put them in this area, but in this space, I need different people to support me and to be the people I can have those conversations with. Oh, absolutely. There are folks in my family and my friend circle that I can count on to be there in this situation. There are folks I cannot, not because they're bad people, not because they they don't want to be there for me, but because they don't get it. And that's okay. That's all right. You know, uh, I was thinking about what you said earlier and I, I it reminds me of my friend Sam Webb, who always says in his speeches, he's also from Australia. I get a lot of my inspiration from Australians. Um, but We're the but uh, yeah, you are. But he ru he runs this charity called Living, uh, which is just phenomenal. And and he always says in his audiences, you know, what is the one thing, the one thing we people as as a as a human race lie about the most? And it's when they ask the question, are you okay? Oh, what, I'm fine. What, what do we say? I'm fine. Well, it's a similar situation. You didn't want anybody to know about your date and, and, yeah. and, the, and the gentleman not, not showing up um, because of shame and, and really that, that fear that people would judge you because of that. When in reality, it has nothing to do with you. The reason that person didn't show up was that person's reason. And, and who knows what it was. But it wasn't because Kirsty wasn't amazing because you are. It was because... <laughs> It was because someone wasn't on your same wavelength at the same time. Yes. And that, hap and yes. that happens. And, and you so, know, the other thing I think, yeah. though, beneath that is it's not enough for me just to recognize it had nothing to do with me. I feel like what I was working through today is why did it trigger me? Mm. And what I realized is I have this whole pattern. If you, I wrote a whole other blog called I Choose You Every Fucking Time from being bullied <laughs> as a five-year-old. And, you know, when they'd choose teams and they'd never, they'd, I would never be chosen. And so yeah. I have this pattern from a very long time around not being chosen. And I realized yeah. today that was my aha. So he yeah. had just re-triggered an old wound. And I went, okay, so that's where I go, like, I need to do my work around this. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's often how I feel when someone in my life passes away. I have severe abandonment struggles that I've had since I was an infant in my traumatic infancy. Uh, in the first nine months of my life uh, were spent with my biological mom and dad who were on drugs, uh, leaving me and my brother unattended to go score those drugs or do or sell drugs. And, uh, and in those situations, um, I was an infant being left alone with barely a diaper on with a distended belly filled with liquid and bruises from the top of my sternum to the bottom of my abdomen from being malnourished. We were fed what mom and dad could steal, Kool-Aid, Coca-Cola, and sour milk was our diet. Um, and so when, when, when my birth parents, uh, when I was taken from them uh, and placed in foster care, and when my birth brother died in foster care, 
um, you know, it, even as an infant, this affected me terribly. The first three to nine months of any infant's life are the most crucial for their ability to connect, adapt, attach, and be well in any future. And my assessment is, is if you have all of that trauma going on, at some point, something's got to give and you're going to have a hard time. It turned out my biological parents both have been separately diagnosed with manic depression, what we today call bipolar disorder. So all of this combined to say that fear of losses of loved ones, whether that means physically forever being lost because they've passed away, or that means that they're exiting your life for whatever reason, it, it, for people with abandonment struggles, it is devastating. Um, and, and, you know, as I got older, realizing the people I could count on and building those protective relationships, those personal protectors, um, I'm able to voice these feelings of loss, even from my early infancy um, and, and from anybody in my life that's passed on to people who care. And that's important. It's important to voice your pain. And one of the things I say every speech is if you're going to do learn one thing from this speech and only one thing, never again silence your pain. Why? Because your pain is real, your pain is valid, and your pain matters because you do. When we yeah. silence and bury our pain, it only builds up and explodes in things like violence, rage, aggression, anger. It builds up in things like uh, substance use disorder, and it builds up in things like suicidal thoughts, ideas, or actions. But if you can once recognize, and only once, and then from then on do the same, that your thoughts do not have to become your actions. If they did, we'd all be in trouble at some point. Yeah, I love that. And I think, you know, I talk a lot about uh, similarly with numbing that people, you know, um, and there's a spectrum. They, they say our emotions are not discerning. So if we numb pain, we numb joy and you feel something mm -hmm. in the middle. And so I have been working on that the last three years to really be OK with levels of discomfort, to be OK with with what happened last night. And today, all I wanted to do was eat fries and numb <laughs> food. But like, you know, I caught myself in it and it's taken years to get to this point. So I think for people listening, they have to recognize that it's not going to switch overnight. Once you start being self-aware and you start recognizing what's going on and you start noticing when you don't like a feeling or you feel uncomfortable in something or somebody triggers you or a conversation makes you anxious or someone doesn't support you, then look at, well, what's your behavior? Because usually it's eating, drinking, sex, something where we're using something unhealthily to push down those feelings. And I think all of that is like a work of art that we have to figure out. Yeah. And I think once we realize that we don't have to silence our pain, that we can find people to talk to, whether that's a therapist, a clergy, a family member, a friend, a loved one, a confidant, or just someone you met over coffee, never silencing your pain unburdens your soul from that pain because yeah. you are getting it off your chest at the time you desperately need to in an honest and 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 and, and, and uh, appropriate and and healthy functioning manner mm -hmm. um so uh i realized that if i was going to be honest uh, about my struggles hell i was going to be honest to everybody and when someone's at a speech and they ask me hey and this happens they'll say kevin you know you talk about this, but how are you really doing today? I will tell that person the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me, so help me you know who, no matter you're the asking. outcome, no matter the truth, you're asking me a direct question. I'm going to tell you how I'm really feeling. Um, and I'm going to be okay with that. And, and I don't need you to uh, respond in a certain way. I don't need you to understand or even empathize. I just need you to hear me. Uh, and, and if you can do that, we're, we're all good. You know, and, I, and I'll do the same for you. Every speech I go to, someone tells me about their pain. I'm going to listen intently. I'm going to be there in the present moment. And I'm going to do my best um, to, to be a, a source of hope and light for that person. When I think, you know, I'm a big believer that when we share our truth, we heal ourselves and we heal others. But I also know that in sharing my truth, it's made some people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned from that is that that's okay too. I'm a mirror yeah. that they don't like. They're not ready to see. The more <laughs> I've become truthful, like I remember one friend who was cheating on their partner at the time who just like backed off, could not deal with being around me. I've had several friends who are going through some really tough times 
And I noticed that it's always around that time when they're almost like on the precipice of a breakthrough and sort of figuring out are they going to go one way or another and when my truth is too much of a mirror for them. And so yeah. I've gotten okay with that too and gone, it's not about me. Like I have to be okay with those feelings. Yeah, recognizing that everybody, to each is their own, right? I mean, you know, uh, one of the things we do is we project our feelings on other people um, and, 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 and put it on them when in fact we need to recognize our own internal struggle and say, you know what, it's okay to feel this tumultuous inside. It's okay to feel this unwell and everybody's got struggles. I need to recognize that they might be going through their own and it might not be about me. Exactly. Yeah. And they're, and they're, and that's okay too. You can keep being a truth teller and when they're ready, they come back. <laughs> and yeah. But yeah. you know, but just accepting you, you might be a trigger. Now we've had a couple of guys, um, Craig and Ken, who've shared that they, um, Craig lost his son, um, and his father this summer and his son to suicide. And um, Ken also mentioned that he uh, lost his brother, shot in a gang, uh, sister when she was young, brother. So I know that your new documentary is um, out, The Ripple Effect, um, and the work you are doing there is really helping families who, because after your journey, you really started to realise what an impact it had on your father and your sister and I was watching the trailer and I think uh, your sister said even to this day, she still carries this fear of like getting uh, a phone call and, and blaming herself, holding the guilt. So what do you feel compelled to share with family members? Well, listen, to those of you who have lost loved ones, I, I am terribly sorry. It is devastating. It stays with you the rest of your life and it pains you the rest of your life. There's no doubt about that. And there's, there's oftentimes no way to quell that, that, that pain because it's so deep. If you love that person dearly, you're in pain. And uh, for those of you who have lost loved ones, I'm sorry. Uh, the film Suicide, the Ripple Effect is actually out next year uh, by myself and my, and my uh, co-director and co-producer, Greg DeCherry. Um, and we're two guys with bipolar disorder who opted to make a film, which we believed in uh, from the very get-go. And a lot of people got behind this film financially, emotionally, mentally, physically, and helped us get the work done to make this possible. Our, our good uh, editor, Ryan Moser, was phenomenal. Um, and, and we, we put something together that we did not even expect would exist. Something that when it came out, the trailer, uh, which was just about four or five minute trailer, which is a sneak preview. It's not even the official trailer. When that came out within four months, seven people wrote to us and said, I was thinking of suicide. I was even in the middle of an attempt. I said to myself, does anybody care? Went on Facebook, typed in the word suicide, found your trailer for suicide, the ripple effect. And I'm going to stay here and I'm asking for help. And I, and then they've done so, um, uh, wow. you know, uh, 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 Dr. John Draper of the national suicide branch lifeline said this film will save lives. Um, it, it's had a really good response with the people who have, who have previewed it, um, for, for, for testimonial writings. But, um, I'll tell you something, um, that loss that my family felt and I lived from what I did was absolutely life-changing and devastating. In the film, I talk about how I asked my father during the film proceedings, during the process of making the film, if he still feared my death by suicide. And my father looked into the camera, looked at me and said, Kevin, every time the phone rings. He didn't say every time I call him. He says when the phone goes off in his pocket, his first and every inclination is my son, Kevin, alive. And my actions did that. And I take responsibility for my actions. I am here. So whenever my father calls and says, hey, Kevin, are you OK? Kevin, are you in danger? Kevin, are you suicidal? Kevin, I used to get so upset until I realized the effect that my actions had on the people who love me. And although I might get fatigued with people always saying to me, Kevin, are you OK? Today, I don't I don't judge them and I don't get angry like I used to. At like, oh, you know, I'm fine. Why are you always so worried about me? Which is what used to happen. Today, I go. Every time somebody who loves me is going to ask me that question, I'm going to tell them the hard truth. And I'm going to let them know I'm going to be all right. It's just going to take some time. Um, and and in, in being brutally honest about those things, they know that when I tell them, it's the truth. See? So wow. they know that, that I'm going to be okay and I'm going to get past this, this, this particular juncture in my life of pain 
and I'm going to come out on the other side, um, and I'm going to move forward. And, and I believe that those of us who lose people to suicide or to any way of, of death, uh, it, the gentleman said he lost his son uh, to a shooting, um, you know, or, or his brother rather. And, and and you know, any way we lose someone is devastating. When it's tragic, it's even worse. Uh, and when it's suicide, it is awful. Um, but I don't. I don't. Well, you can think, you can never get closure. You can never ask uh, them why. Right. And and that and that, you, that that damn question why is so elusive and we can never get the truth because that person is no longer here and that's what hurts the most. Um, but you know, when someone we lose this way goes, we can look to the living and move forward. We, I don't even think we can ever move on. That's too hard to do, uh, in these situations, but we can look to the living and move forward. Uh, and I got that quote from Sheila Hamilton, uh, and her book, uh, also an advocate in the field. And, and, you know, I, I search for my inspiration to keep moving forward in my painful moments uh, with all the mental health advocates I can find around the world. Uh, a lot of them which are in the film Suicide, The Ripple Effect. And I think that if you are someone, if you're someone who's lost someone in this way, definitely when this film comes out, check it out because it's going to leave you with a call to action to hope that's going to that's gonna leave a, a warm source in your heart. Well, and I think that, you know, grief is, is on the mental health spectrum too. Um, and, and that's a big part of it is learning how mentally to be well and how to get ourselves through that cycle and through the anger and the, um, disbelief and to a place of acceptance with anything that goes on in life. Um, and grief is just a lot harder. It's a lot harder. And, and people, certainly in America, I bet, I bet it's the same all around the world. Um, look at grief in a funny way. They say to you, oh, come on, it's been two years. Why aren't you over this now? That is not how grief works. If you love someone unconditionally in any way you love them and they pass on, however they pass on, that stays with you forever. And that's okay. It's okay to grieve forever. Don't let anybody ever tell you different. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I remember meeting my um, cleaner when she, when I first met her, her son had died at uh, 21 in a car accident and she was still going to the grave every day and um, wouldn't let anyone in his room, wouldn't move any of his stuff. The other children were missing out on a mother. Um, so I think that there's, you know, what I worked through with her is the difference between um, not forgetting him because she really didn't want him to think that she didn't love him and she'd forgotten him and learning how she could bring him into her life every day. So now she wears a necklace and she's allowed the other children to be, have some of his objects and be in his room and they now cook his favorite dinner and they talk about him instead of going, we're supposed to forget it or we go to the graveyard to celebrate him and we don't move on. She's now at a place where he's with her all the time and she yeah. has permission to talk about him rather than leaving him behind or leaving uh, him in the, at the graveyard. So important. You know, uh, my buddy also in the film, Suicide the Rule Effect, Nick Newling, uh, an advocate of, of great change. Uh, he says in the film, the best way to grieve is together. Uh, and I believe that is nothing more than the truth. The best way to grieve is together mm. with people who also love that individual who can remember fondly the, that individual and that and their purpose in this world uh, to, to bring us hope in, in our in our darkest hours when we think of how much light they brought to this world. When I think of the people I've lost to suicide, Kirsty, I've lost I've lost six people in my life to suicide that I love dearly uh, and cared for immensely. The first being my my high school uh, drama teacher and acting. Uh, director, uh, Mr. John Fennell, who is who I feature in the film. Um, you know, when I when I when I think about them, you, I don't think about the way they died. I don't think about the day or the way they attempted. I think about and I celebrate their birthday, the way they lived, the beauty and light that they were on this planet, and the and the love they they transferred from their hearts to me before they passed. I think about the positive and I, I had to, I had to hone in and force myself to go from thinking about all the negative of a suicide to all the positive of the life that they gave us before they left us. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a, it's a good 
platform to figure out a way that when you lose someone to suicide, to force yourself to think about the positive that they were, not the way that they left this earth. If you yeah. can find a way over time to do that, I believe you can heal and once again move forward. Not on, but forward, <laughs> forward. as you look But as I think, Kevin, with all of this that I'm hearing from you, with getting your personal protectors in place, with reframing grief and looking at the positive in the life that they lived instead of the dark, with all of these things that you've mentioned, all of them are work. And, oh. and I really want to reiterate that to anybody who's watching, that this stuff doesn't come easy. This is the most important work that we can do, I believe, on this journey, is what I call the inner work. And doing the work in those moments when you get rejected or stood up or you're feeling like a friend doesn't support you or you're lonely and you're tired or you're thinking about suicide or you've lost a loved one, like or in all of those moments, we get to choose, are we going to sink into the depression? Are we going to um, allow these thoughts to start to take over? Or are we going to reach out to a personal protector? Are we going to be vulnerable? Are we going to go and run 10 miles because we know it's going to help us feel better? Are we going to get enough sleep? Like, are we going to put our tool kit on and actually dig into it and, and get some stuff out? That's what I feel like you're constantly reinforcing that you're finding all these tools so that you can reframe pain and deal with things. Yeah, no, my, my work ethic to be brain well is the most important work ethic I have. Uh, and if I'm not working tirelessly to better my brain health, then I don't feel good. And if I don't feel good, then I lead myself down a dark and dangerous path. So, so yes, it is a great deal of work. And maybe that seems daunting and terrifying to some people in the beginning of their pain. But let me tell you something. Once you realize you have the power within yourself to do that work, to, 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 to uh, uh, master one step at a time of the art of wellness, you can change your life. Um, you know, using common sense tools can change your life uh, for the better <laughs> o over time. It, it's it. No, I mean, it, it, people don't, it's don't, don't think about it. It's we have the capacity it's within to, to use all these tools. Now, Craig just said that he has found it hard to find the positives with his son passing. And I just want to reiterate that you weren't saying to find the positives in the fact that he's gone. It's finding a positive in the person's life. Looking at yeah. trying every time you start going down that rabbit hole of the negative that they're not here to instead be focused on how they lived, how happy they made you, maybe a, a special time. Is that more what you? Yeah, no. It, it, really, even if the, the 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 son or daughter you lost was an infant when you lost them, or or if they're adults, that that the point is that remembering the light that they were and that when if they were an infant when people held them and they looked at them and they smiled from ear to ear thinking look at this beautiful baby boy or girl or the first uh the first time uh, if they're older the first time they learn how to ride a bike or the first time um they said thank you when they were growing up or the first time they gave you a hug and you knew it was more than just a hug mm. it was love you know, those are the things you have to try to focus on. And I realize this is all easier said than done. <laughs> but my, my friend Craig, it's possible. And I'm sorry for your loss. I'm terribly sorry. But remember the beauty and the light that your son was and that he will forever be right here in your heart. And if you can remember that, if you can let that light still shine, even though he's gone, you can have a, a, a moment of 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 hope and gratitude, I think, for the fact that he was here for the time he was. And I know that doesn't help you or bring your son back. I recognize that. But what you can do is realize the truth in that hope and that light and how, how much he will always mean to you. Thank you. And I'm sorry for your loss too, Craig. I, I just can't even comprehend what a parent would feel Let's speak a little bit about um, guilt. I think that there's, you know, I spoke with a mother a few weeks back who had lost her son to suicide and I think for anyone who's left behind, there's incredible guilt and I know that your sister and some of your friends spoke to that in the documentary. So, and, and I'm sure you feel or felt back then tremendous guilt that you had caused this pain 
when you realized that you were going to make it. Um, so what, what do you want to say about that word guilt? You know, uh, people often say suicides are selfish. I'm here to tell you they're not. To be selfish, you have to know you're hurting some people, any people, people who die by suicide. I don't say the word commit, Kirsty, because I don't believe in that terminology. Uh, committing a crime, committing adultery, those are very different things from dying by suicide from your pain, mm -hmm. just like anyone would die of any other organ diseased, right? Mm -hmm. So, so um, that guilt that 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 my family or friends felt when I did what I did, it doesn't belong to them. It never did. It wasn't theirs to harbor or bear. And that what their the blame wasn't theirs to harbor or bear. They didn't do anything wrong. And that's a common thing I hear from parents who've lost people to suicide, their loved ones, their children, is they feel like they did something wrong. And unless you have a completely dysfunctional family life where you are abusing your child, you usually didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's still to say even that, the, the suicide's not your fault. Well, I think they but, can also feel like if I had have done more, maybe I should I have this, called them. If I did if, that, if, if I called I, them, if I showed up. Therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if I, you know, they, they called me and I didn't, I wasn't there for them that day. Yeah. I had that situation happen with a friend of mine. Uh, I had seen him at a party. He looked amazing. He was smiling. He was laughing. He was gregariously engaging with his friends at a birthday party. And he says to me in the party, Kevin, oh man, you saved my life. And I, 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 it just went over my head because I was having such a good time with my wife at the party. And it just went over my head. I didn't even think about it. And the last thing he said to me before he left that party was, Kevin, will you call me more often? And I said, sure, I will. Of course I will. I called him once in the next three months. And at the end of those three months, he was gone forever by suicide. And I cannot tell you the work my wife had to do to, to, to keep me smiling that uh, after that happened, because I just believed if I had just called him more often, like he asked me to, he would be here. But that is delusional. Well, and it's that, such an enormous responsibility. It's an enormous responsibility. You know? This young man did not, my friend did not die because I did not call him. That's ridiculous. Uh, it's nonsensical. But we believe these things in our time of great pain. Um, and I had to recognize later on that it wasn't my fault. But I'll tell you the one that got me the most, the one you mentioned from the, from the video, the film trailer. My, my, uh, my sister told me for the first time in front of a massive a group, about 80 people at a, at a speaking event where we were hosting the new film trailer uh the, the the sneak peek and um and having people over to see it she gets up to this to the pulpit and says uh kevin doesn't know this um but i blame myself for 15 years after his attempt i thought it was my fault and my sister god bless her she had become this nomad wandering america with, with barely a home homeless for some time. Um, and she had gotten to a position in her situation where she was ready to give it all up and to take her life and to die by suicide. Um, and she goes and she gives away her cat and her dog to someone she barely knew from Craigslist at a supermarket. And that's when someone looked at her as she was broke down, crying on the ground, ready to take her life. Somebody, a kind Samaritan, looked at her and said, hey, is everything okay? Are you okay? Can I help you? And if you know anything about my story, you know the, the three things I wanted one person to say as I sat on that bus contemplating the end of my days by suicide before I went to the Golden Gate Bridge was, are you okay? Is something wrong? Or can I help you? And this person asked my sister two of those three things. And then said to my sister, you look like you're in need. How about I give you a job? And she did. And yeah. that's what kept my sister here, having nothing to do with me or my family, having to do with a new, uh, a newly made family member that she created. Wow. Um, because and she I was in we, pain and someone recognized that pain and for what it was. I'm so grateful that that person took that moment to stop and, 
you know, I can't tell you how many times I was I was in a um, a line on the way for a flight to China, and a woman collapsed on the floor, hysterical. Like I've never seen anything like it. Like this was an epic meltdown, and everyone stood back. So I got on the floor with her, and I realized that she had been notified that her mother had died before she got on the flight home. And I just put my whole body around her because she was literally convulsing and just sat with her. And it took me three hours to get her on our flight. <laughs> I had to talk to her husband. She couldn't speak. Um, and there's just so many situations that happen like that where I see people do nothing. Not one other person, not even the airline staff came over to check on us. I was on the floor with her 20 minutes before someone even came to, to help because I couldn't get up and leave. Yeah. So for anybody listening, like that saved Kevin's sister's life. And there's a statistic somewhere out there that like there, there was a whole lot of people who'd committed suicide that had been studied and asked questions. And a whole lot of them said that the reason that they didn't on that day was because somebody asked them if they were okay or in some way yeah. checked in. they felt yeah. a human connection. Yeah. So when you're on a bus or a plane or in a line, like, and you see someone, like I do it all the time. I see people in Target who are walking past crying on the phone and I'll just stop and grab their arm be like, are you okay? Are you okay? Like take that moment to check in with people around you. Like we are a big community. And we, we really are and we can be in an even greater community if we just put down our cell phones for five minutes yes. and realize that there are other people around us. Yes. You know, no pressure, but you know, <laughs> when you see someone in pain, if we're going to ask people in pain to never silence their pain, we have to ask the people who see those people in pain to say, are you okay? Every time. And to look at that person without judgment, without re reproach and say, you know what? I don't know who you are, but I got your back because you're a human being. Um, and, and I'm a human being and we got that in common. So when you see someone struggling, when you see someone crying and they may be by themselves, it, 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 it doesn't cost you a dime to walk up and say, hey, are you all right? You know, I just want to make sure you're okay. I do it all the time. Kirsty, you do it all the time. And it's just the right thing to do. Um, and, and also, there's going to be the people who look at you and go, you need to get away from me. I'm, <laughs> I, 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 need, I need to cry. And you don't, I don't know you, man. But there's going to be the people. I, I hugged someone the other day. I just started, I just went in for the hug and she started yeah. sobbing on my shoulder. And like, we'll never see each other again. And it's okay. So I think that okay. those, um, those yeah, moments okay. are beautiful. Now you say you have a great line. You are your brother and sister's keepers. And you say that to the students at high schools. Um, and I think that's just fantastic. What does that mean to you? Well, I certainly didn't make that line up. <laughs> but, but I do say it all the time. I say we are, if nothing else on this planet, our brothers and sisters keepers above all else. And I say that you don't have to have faith in a higher power like I do to know that. To know that we're not here for our own personal betterment or gain. We're here to give back to those we know, those we love, those we care about, those we don't know from Adam, and yes, those we don't even like. We are here to prop people up who are in pain. What we're not here to do is to hurt people with words or actions. All the hate groups out there, I'm talking to you. What we're not <laughs> here to do uh, is bully those kids in school that we sit next to in class just because we can what or, we're in not here to, or, in the, or in the workplace what we're not here to do is cyber bully kids just because we know it gets them in their goat and really hurts them if you get a kick out of hurting other people you need to ask for help yourself because something is wrong yes. if you get a, get a kick out of making other people hurt there is something terribly wrong inside that you need to address and you're likely to have your own psychological problems so consider that, okay? We are here to give back to those around us. I know it in my gut. I know it in my heart. You know, when I was a little kid, I was four years old when I went over to my neighbor's house and he was mowing his lawn with his giant John Deere lawnmower. And I said, can I please help? You look tired, <laughs> you know? And he's like, well, do you know how to mow with a John Deere lawnmower? I said, uh, no, but I can learn. He said, Kevin, I'm fine. This is dangerous. Thank you for the offer, but I, I appreciate it. Um, but I knew even as a kid that helping people was the key to, to, to living a good life um, and to being a good person. Uh, now I, I do a lot of things wrong. I mess up all the time. I have my flaws um, just like anybody else. Uh, but I believe in helping your fellow man, woman, and child and, and everybody in between because um, 
we are here and there is a greater purpose. And I believe it is a beautiful one filled with light and not a dark one. Well, and I think that, you know, well, I know there's a thing called the helper's high that they've also researched in terms of when you give, it actually it gives yeah. all kinds of endorphins. But what I've noticed in the work I've done volunteering and with um, the homeless and different organisations is that mostly people, like you said, it costs nothing. Mostly people want to be seen. They want to feel like they're not invisible in this society, especially those with mental health and people who are stigmatised and people yeah. who are homeless. Um, who, you know, the today I was in the coffee shop and there's a priest who comes in and there was a homeless guy sitting there and I'd already had a chat with him. And when the, everyone else kind of just didn't really talk to him, would move their chairs a little bit further away in case he smelt or would make eye contact. And then the priest sat down and he like said, hi, how are you going? And get, had a whole conversation with him before he sat down. And, um, and I know him because he comes in all the time. And afterwards I said to him like, I really noticed that and I'm so glad that you did that because all he wanted was to come in and have a cup of coffee and feel like a normal human being with every yeah. other business person yeah. who was in there. Yeah. Um, and he, he just wanted to be seen. He just wanted to have a moment to connect in a normal way. Um, yeah. And so we have to remember that sometime. And I love that you're talking about, you know, when hurt people hurt people. And so if you are lashing out, if you are angry, if you are mean, if you are a bully and not just children, but in the workplace, it happens all the time. You know, you need to check yourself before you wreck yourself and go and get some support, <laughs> go and get some help and um, and talk to people. So, so many people have said, I love this conversation a thousand times. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and uh, some have just tuned in, so you're going to have to go back and watch the whole hour because it's been amazing. <laughs> so we, we, this is the longest one I've done. I just feel like I could do <laughs> all night. Let's keep talking, Jersey. I Come know, on. We I know, but time. it's like you actually need to go to bed because uh, it's later <laughs> where you are too. Um, yeah, and I'm yeah. so grateful for your time, and I hope everyone goes and checks out the documentary. But so what do, is there anything on your heart that you want to share as a final send-off? You know, I just, I, I believe it in my heart. I say it all the time. If you're struggling, keep on keeping on no matter what. Recognize that hope does help heal. And whatever you do, whatever you do, please, in that pain you're going through, fight to be here tomorrow because you're needed, you're loved, you're cared for, you matter. And fight not for someone else's wanting you to be here. Fight because you deserve to be here because, damn it, you are important. And you are valued and you are loved. And if nobody else will tell you they love you, I love you. Now get up, stand up for yourself in two feet of water while you're drowning and ask for help. If you can't find help, fight to build that help for yourself. And if you can fight, you can stay here. I love that. I love that. And I love you too in case you need anyone else <laughs> to tell you tonight. And um, really quick, if, you, if you're in crisis right now in America, text CNQR to 741-741, text CNQR to 741-741. C stands for courage to talk about your mental health. N stands for normalize the conversation. Q stands for ask those questions bluntly and honestly. Are you suicidal and do you have a plan? And R stands for recovery because I promise it's possible. I'm living proof. Be here tomorrow. Thank you very much, Kirsty. I love that. So um, website is kevinhines.com. You said which page is the 10 steps uh, to? Yeah, yeah it's kevinhinesstory.com. And you go to the multimedia page and you can find right in there uh, the 10 step art of wellness guide I have that helps me stay well. Great. Um, and I'll suicide the ripple effect. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And I'll suicide the ripple effect.com is the, is the film website and at the effect film for Instagram and Twitter. Okay, great. I'm going to put both those links in the comments um, when we wrap up. So thank you for your thank heart you. and your story and sharing with everyone. And for anybody who has just tuned in, go back and watch the last hour because it has been amazing, chock full of tips and tools and just a phenomenal wisdom and advice. So thank you, Kevin. Um, for anyone who is just joining us, we have um, over 100 episodes on Kirsty TV, the YouTube channel. So feel free to go there and have a look at the playlist on everything through from rape, trauma, mental health, addiction, the full spectrum. So go and get your resources and join us every Tuesday at 7 p.m. PST so we can do this more often. Mwah! Love you all.